I, this is a thrill for me. This is, holy cow. This was not on the agenda. I didn't clue you in that this was going to happen, but as shy as all of you are, you know, I somehow I appreciate you stepping up. Knowing I was coming here, I knew this would happen, and you can't surprise me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike Bellani, you've known Dave Wellenzone way before me. Give me your best Dave Wellenzone story. Five years, never see the skunk, that's all I'm going to say. No, but just a great, great guy. So Mike Ferguson, tell me about Mike Ferguson. You know, similar. I mean, when we um, uh, got involved here and needed, you know, someone here, Mike had, we had chatted, and I knew his background here, you know, on, on radio from, from down the street in <coughs> and uh, we met at the ballpark and when he took over once again I mean just the uh, you know 24-7 mentality and um, just the loyalty to this community and I think someone had mentioned it earlier uh, when you walk into that ballpark the tradition of Jamestown baseball sort of overtakes you it's not the 30 million dollar new stadium it's um, you know, doesn't have all the bells and whistles that you see around now, but it has the, the tradition, and you can feel that in the air, and I think a lot of, not a lot, but I think it, it's due to the namesake and Mr. Baseball here, mm -hmm. and I think what Russ brought out earlier about, um, you know, extra innings is probably a great title for, you know, the next stage of, you know, Jamestown, you know, baseball, and I think the opportunity you have now with the cutbacks in professional baseball, you know, Russ is probably right. Profe professional baseball probably will not come back in the way it was in the past, but I think what you have here now um, is a great opportunity because I think prof Major League Baseball and professional baseball per se <coughs> is gonna be looking at these types of leagues um, for their future. So I don't think in, in the selling and promotion of, you know, the, the uh, Jamestown baseball in 2021 and beyond, um, I don't think there should be any concern that it isn't affiliated with the Montreal Expos or the Detroit Tigers or, you know, uh, Florida Marlins, any of those affiliated teams. I think looking at these young players and saying these could be you know, future big league players, or these are, you know, qualified college players, and you're looking at the game of baseball, and I think that's what has to be sold, is come down and support the game of baseball, that all those players on the field um, are here under, you know, the great, um, you know, manager and coaches to play the game, the game that Russ talked about, of, you know, pick up at the, the you know, the, the park in, in town. So I, I think selling the game of baseball really has to be the hallmark of the future here because that's where you're gonna see the talent. Nowhere in the past could you come in and say, yeah, you're gonna see the future Expos or the future Tiger. But I mean, that climb up that ladder from this level of, you know, the short season A is a long, long ride up and only a few make it. So, you know, I, I'm excited about what you have here. I'm mostly excited about the group that you, Greg, and the others have put together in solidifying uh, the future of, uh, of organized baseball here in, you know, this great city. And then, you know, this book now gives you something really solid to stand behind and to show people of the history of baseball in this community. So Mike Ferguson, 
during 1994, the first year of the Jamestown Jammers, we have a game against Batavia, which is the last game of the season. We must win in order to make the playoffs. Bob and Mindy are there, you're there, the place is packed. And the excitement, I'm videotaping because I can't believe we're down you know, by a run. We actually tie it up in the ninth. But there was this guy that kept floating around. He wasn't a mascot, <laughs> cheering the crowd. And he was a radio announcer from WKSN named Mike Ferguson. And you said it because we were sitting nearby, who the hell is that? And that was really your first introduction, certainly probably mine, to really uh, the enthusiasm of Mike Ferguson. So then Mike shortly thereafter becomes the, the general manager of the team, going from radio down to a baseball. And what was your sense of baseball at that time, Mike? Oh, amazing. Well, you know, Mike and I, and, and, and Mike forgets we met, met very many, many years before Jamestown with the Derek Perryman Liverpool. Oh, and Mike had, uh, I was on the radio doing a fundraiser in Fredonia <clears throat> for a young man in Fredonia who, who had a young child, uh, had a bad liver, was look, trying to raise money to have a liver replaced. And they had created the Derek Perryman Liver Fund. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if you called me or I called you and he says, I got an idea. Uh, we're going to have a, a bring your liver, liver to the ballpark night at, at the rock pile. And so, you know, I can bring Derek down. It's a free admission if you bring a new liver for Derek. And he, the whole thing was typical Bellani, you know. And then and, and years later, um, you know, I was born and raised in Buffalo and uh, a, a transplant uh, to Chautauqua County. And, um, you know, this is it. And I, I would say, with respect, with respect to uh, Mr. Baseball, maybe not call it the extra inning, because extra innings for those of us Yankees fans who watched until two o'clock in the morning the other night. Extra innings means there's an end coming. Okay, maybe the ninth inning, maybe the seventh inning stretch uh, means that there's many more years to come uh, for baseball in, in Jamestown. I mean, it, this community is baseball. You learn that with Mr. Barone who you know, was a child back when I was uh, uh, running, running the, the, the team. But, you know, his experiences, the people that, that Paul Lombardo has turned on to, and I, I wore his Indian shirt to, out of respect to him today. But, you know, um, uh, sorry about that. But I, Yanks had to take him out this week. But, um, you know, the, these people, you've had people that just, from Russ to Paul and so many others, that just continued the legacy of baseball and bringing young people up, small people up, you know, and that's what did it for me. Uh, I, growing up in baseball, I mean, growing up in Buffalo, um, we went and saw the Bisons. We went I'd, and and going to the going to the the rock pile and going to um, the odd to walk in and hear that, you know, and it sounds corny, the crack of the bat and the slap of the glove and and hearing the music and the, and the vendors and the hawkers and you know selling and smelling those hot dogs and popcorn and everything else that's what did it that's what got me involved in uh, love of sports and um, you know to be able to I was so hooked on it that when they tore down the stadium I was one of the last people that was allowed in to take I actually had the back the backstop net that that, that was uh, behind the the, uh, the the catchers uh, catchers area. I had the, uh, I'm pretty sure I got Bob and Mindy's season, season seats out of that stadium too with the, the security guard says, very good, there's the last day. If you're gonna take anything out, you better take it out. Um, and and uh, it's just that appreciation and love of the sport. And you know, it was going to Bison's hockey games before the Sabres existed. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, uh, you know, the two, my wife's not here, I think, okay. The two biggest days of my life, besides getting married, uh, was not only uh, the privilege of continuing baseball in Jamestown, and I went, didn't start as general manager. Mike issued me the same title that Bob Rich had, uh, had given him, is director of, uh, of uh, market sales, marketing, group sales, and promotions, and uh, he bestowed that upon me before before I became general manager. And the next one was the ability to be able to, to uh, 
run a professional sports team at, at, at that time, HSBC Arena. Again, through a connection to Mike. I mean, uh, Mike was the one who called me and, and, and asked if I'd be interested. So I was able to uh, run a team in my hometown, which was a dream in 18,000 seats. And I was able to, uh, my second hometown, which is Jamestown, uh, run a professional sports team here. We were affiliated with the Tigers after the Expos. And um, there were some incredibly wonderful times and there were some incredibly tragic times, as, as Scott mentioned, the, the death of Dwight Lowry. I mean, it was the first time that the New York Penn League had been shut down since uh, the early World War, you know. And that was just to make, uh, I think they were making, uh, they, they had gotten men and women together to make, uh, make things for the U.S. Army, and they stopped, uh, they stopped baseball. So uh, it was the first time to stop it, and there were wonderful people that really showed Major League Baseball, that baseball baseball belongs in Jamestown because this community rallied together for Dwight's family who was living here and knew nobody. Uh, and of course the famous story when they stole all our uniforms one night. Somebody in town stole all the uniforms and we played as the Detroit Tigers for the next three weeks. You know, an actual, Detroit was great. They had the, they had full sets of Major League Baseball home and aways you know, at our doorstep the next, very next day. So um, again, I could tell stories from now until tomorrow, and you all know I have the ability to tell stories from now until tomorrow. And there's some great gentlemen sitting here that that uh, that took the reins after after I left, and after uh, guys like Matt Dwyer left, and and, uh, and Mike, and uh, history of baseball between Buffalo and Jamestown for Dave, and and of course uh, we've we got an active coach at the end of the bench here who's who's still involved in in, in coaching and and uh, some of the crazy promotions that, that he was involved with there. So I'll let them speak. Well, you're, you're talking about uh, events of, of, of magnitude, uh, and David Wellenzone does not want me to talk about it. I will, therefore I will. Uh, the video you did not see because we ran out of time and we wanted a hot dog, but it was a four minute piece that is up on YouTube, by the way. And it was uh, a magical, magical event in New York Penn League history. It was the return of the Brooklyn baseball. And I remember reading about the schedule and the schedule gods placed the very first game of the return of Brooklyn baseball, Jamestown. So that wasn't lost on me. So I reached out to Carl Erskine. Why? Because he had a son, uh, by the way, Carl's still alive, he's 93 years old. Uh, who's got a developmental disability and very well known and he cared for him and wanted to bring him here. That was the hook to come not only to Brooklyn opening day but the resource center and he did. He came and phenomenal. Uh, uh, one of the things that Carl, because he's with me most of the day, I gave him a hat. I gave him a jammer's hat and he was pleased and he put it on. Just a good sport, wore the hat. And he continued to wear the hat, never took off the hat, to the chagrin of Brooklyn. I mean, think about, we had him for opening pitch, we had him, you know, he was the guy. Every news outlet seemingly in New York City came here for that event, USA Today, everything was Brooklyn, 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 it happened to be in Jamestown. But to set up the scene, uh, all of that was going, and Dave Wallen's own general manager extraordinaire, and promotional guy extraordinaire came up with the idea, let's uh, use Carl Erskine's harmonica playing ability, he was very good, uh, to do the uh, seventh inning stretch. So, David, why don't you take it from there? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, I have a very ferocious temper when I get all fired up. And I was, it was, as Greg said, we put together, we got Carl Erskine in, and I'll preface that just by saying most of what, all the craziness I did in the five years I was here with the thing came from him. <laughs> I learned from Bellani and M M Bob and Mindy Ray. <coughs> Anybody could throw any idea against the wall and he would say, well, we'll think it over. I mean, it was, well, liver at a ballpark, that it says enough, but. <laughs> uh, so back to Carl Erskine. So at Dietrich Park, the 
for a seventh inning stretch, we have to run out and put the microphones in this antiquated 1940. Oh, it was terrible. Well, I was all fired. I couldn't get it in, couldn't get it in. I started screaming at future general manager, Matt. Little do I know, he's out there filming everything. I guess it was. But we rallied, we got him. We got yeah. Carl Erskine up to the press box. And we had, I think the only time, we had an eighth inning stretch. And because that was the boss, I said, this is what we're doing today. Folks, it's an eighth inning stretch. Here's Carl Erskine, take me out there. And, he, and it went over wonderful. He filmed it all. He just sent me a month ago the tape. And I said, come on, it's over. I don't want to continue to see my hair. I had a full head of hair. I mean, it was all different. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I take pride in it, only because I realized after I said, oh, I was a jerk. But I know, I was a jerk many times over there, and it was just, uh, but back to the whole thing. My three years at Pilot Field when it first opened, we had 19,000 people there every night. Monday, Tuesday, every night it was packed. And Balani was the GM. I was the head of stadium ops. And everything went. I mean, every, we had promotions, and he taught me which I brought here, well, I went to Wichita first, then brought here, was the players come and go, especially at our level, short season A. You, you don't know who the players are. You kind of kind of know. They can, it's all the smoke and, and mirror, all the stuff that you put around it. If people, when they have no problem parking and the ticket takers are friendly and they walk in and the hot dogs, you got the smell and the popcorn, and you got all the guys from baseball are all there and you've got a good promotion. Every night we tried to have something. I gave away one night and we ate them for a long time because we didn't give away all of them. Wheaties boxes. I said <laughs> to the supermarket, what if we get the athletes are on the, what if we gave away, we, oh yeah, we could get a whole bunch. Well, they gave us enough to fill Pilot Field. Wheaties boxes were up our yin yang. So we had a lot of weedy boxes, <laughs> but that was just a promotion. It was a Tuesday night. What are you going to do? And that was the kind of thing we had and not to blow smoke at these guys, but I broke the attendance records every year. We went higher and higher and higher. And we made profits every year because that's what Rich Products wanted. We had to make sure, so we kept the budget line and everything, and it was, we got new bleachers. Uh, I wish Sam Treacy was here, I really miss Sam. He was the mayor for the whole time I was there. He was the mayor here 20 years, so he was, and he basically, through these guys and through everybody getting to work, we got new bleachers. And they're still there, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got new bleachers. We got a new visitor's clubhouse. Uh, what was the guy's name? Who was the Mets manager? Uh, well, I can't remember. Well, he got he threw a fit because there was no... Blackman. Huh? Blackman. No, it wasn't. It was Third a... Baseman. No, no, Wally Backman. Wally Backman, yeah. I was there. Oh, Jesus, and I was ready to blow up. And I, there's no air conditioning in the visiting clubhouse. And I said, you're in Jamestown, New York. We, you know, what are you going to do? But we ended up getting a new visitor's clubhouse. Then I understand we got a new home one. New bathrooms were built when I was there. That was just every year we tried to get something done. And that was because the community was supporting us. You know, I had the radio show that I would do every Saturday and it would be, again, I got from him, you got to promote, 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 get your name out. And I would interview somebody on Saturday mornings, every Saturday morning. I had Frank Wren, I had uh, the manager, or the general manager of Kansas City now, as he was with the Atlanta Braves when I they came in. Dayton Moore, Dayton Moore. Uh, Dave Dombrowski, I had everybody, did Bob Rich. I might have done you. I don't know if I did you or not. Well, you're on the agenda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I ever get a radio show again, Mike, you're in. And every Saturday, and I would do a 20, 25 minute, just like you do. Ask them one question and they go on for a half hour. And it was perfect. And I got their history of Jamestown. Well, you were in Jamestown, what'd you? Frank Wren loved it. Oh, uh, Frank's, the kid from Jamestown who... Dan Linna. Dan Linna, thank you. Man, I've drawn a blank. 
Dan Lennon, he, he was great. He just told all his different stories about Jamestown. And it was just, I still have those tapes somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just listening to him go, oh my God, that is great. And it was just, a, again, promote, 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 promote. Because the players, we had a 500 team most of the time I was here. We only made the playoffs once. Uh, but we had great crowds because we promote, promote. I used to play the beer people off each other. I'll tell them now because I'm gone 20 years. I'd tell the beer people at whatever the Budweiser dealership is and I'd play them against Cerdo. And I'd tell them, well, they're giving me this and they're giving me this and they're giving me this. I had a great promotion. I had, remember the big sign over the old scoreboard, Budweiser? I got that because, of, and then Cerdo seen that. Oh, they, they put a big one on this side. Well, it's all money into the profit, so it worked out good. I always say, and I've been all over the country. I was in Long Beach, Great Falls, Montana, Florida twice. Batavia Muck Dogs, we won the championship. We beat a team from Jamestown for the only ring I ever got, so I wear it with pride. Uh, Savannah, Georgia, all those different cities. I always say, well, Jamestown's my favorite city. Five years, I, grew, I had great friends here. Uh, just, I loved the city. I loved it. I mean, to the point where I walked in today, and the first thing I asked Greg was, where's that gold room? I remember when you were first just opening this place, there was a room, it was all gold. Well, now it's pink. It's the first room off the front door. And that was just, and I'm gonna say one more thing about Jamestown, just you were mentioning. What I've heard, and this is from an inside source, Major League Baseball is going to give, like the Bisons, they'll be affiliated with Toronto, but it'll no longer be two or four years. It'll be a 10-year deal. Mm. They'll basically say, okay, you're now with Toronto for 10 years. Triple A, double A, two long A's. That's it. All those 40 or 50 teams that they're going to scratch, teams like the Jamestown, Batavia, Auburn, all the way up through the New York Penn League other than Brooklyn and maybe Staten Island. That's 30, 35 players a team. There's going to be 90 players per franchise that are free. Those are good ball players. Those are real good ball players, and they're all going to come here, or they're going to come into the, your independent ball now. You guys are going to have better baseball here than you've ever had. You're, because we used to have short season A. We'd either the first year or the second year of baseball, and they were – all aluminum bat guys, and they couldn't hit wood to save their lives, all but a few. But now you're going to have guys that have experience. You no longer will have an age limit, I don't think. Do you have an age limit in this independent ball? Right now it's college, college age kids. Yeah, I mean, they might with, because Major League Baseball is looking to the independents. They don't want to spend the money on the players. They, they want you guys to spend the money on the players. So that's where you're going to, your expenses will be a little higher. But they then, what you sell a player, let's say you get a kid who's got lightning in a bottle. You can make a good profit on this kid. Mm -hmm. You sell him to the Yankees. And the Yankees then will put him in their long A. And you'll make money on those. So you'll, in the long run, in the next couple, five, six years, Jamestown will be a bigger and better baseball town than it's been in years and years. Well, that's, a, that's our, our hope. You know, and, and at some point in the rich baseball continuum of Ferguson, Welland Zone, there's a guy named Sisson. Mike, did you know anything about George Sisson when he became part, or was he, was he part of your world at all? <clears throat> no? Just what you told me. Just what he told me. So, it's not true. <laughs> talk, George, talk to me about you and Jamestown baseball and whether you have any stories about these guys at all. Um, Actually, I came to Jamestown after an extended period of time of being away from here. I grew up in Gary, graduated from Castlevania Valley, and then I went off to college. And then I, I spent 18 years coaching college basketball. And when I left Roberts Westland, and uh, the idea was to move up the ladder out of the NAIA, I, I couldn't land. It was just a time that things were happening, collegiate base, basketball that didn't open doors and avenues for me. And kind of out of the blue, um, I got a phone call saying that the, the Jammers, the minor league baseball team here in Jamestown, 
was looking for somebody down here. So, you know, my parents were still here in town and the whole nine yards, so I applied. I was 35 years old. I'd already spent 18 years coaching college basketball. Um, had my master's degree. And so they gave me an interview. I came down, I interviewed, and of course, Matt Dreher and Ben Burnett were the two guys that were already in. Matt was like, I don't know, maybe 23, because he'd just taken over from Elstein, who went to, to Wichita. And then Ben was just hired, he was just out of college, and here I come in, and they interviewed me. So I, I went home, and my wife asked me how it went. I said, I think it went pretty well. For, you know, I enjoyed baseball, and I played it all through high school, played for the, uh, the uh, Bombers in the uh, New York Penn League and all that kind of stuff. And didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, like after like five weeks, I got a call. And they offered me the job. I moved down here. I actually lived with my parents and Gary and my wife and four kids stayed in Rochester for the year because we didn't know how long this was going to last. So um, come to find out, it was like three months after I'd been down here that I found out the reason I got the job is because the guy that hired before me didn't pass a drug test. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, everybody, sometimes it's about an injury in minor league baseball that you get your break. I got mine because of the beautiful drug test. But um, so that's, that's how I made the transition from higher education into professional baseball. My memory growing up was sitting on the first base side, wooden bleachers before the metal ones. Ray Shines was the first baseman uh, back when we were the Expos. And I thought it was so cool when I was a little kid when I used to be able to have a chance to come to the games um, that they wore the Major League Baseball uniforms, or the Expo uniforms. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, you know. Because in my eyes, I thought they were the Montreal Expos. I, yeah. I, could, I couldn't, didn't know the difference. But so that's that's how I broke into baseball. Um, moved down here in 2004, and we were just uh, finishing up. I think I had uh, Benny, Benny, what's Benny's name, <laughs> manager. It was his last year. We were with the Tigers, and then we went with the Marlins the next year. So, I think Benny's uh, vegetable garden in the bullpen was the final straw that broke Bob and Mindy's back. Honest to God, this guy he he he, uh, he had us plow up a patch out in the home dugout, so any of the players that were injured had to take care of the garden all summer long. So, um, <laughs> beautiful, great stories, a lot of good stories. Well, obviously, one of those stories. Go ahead. Obviously, after my six years in Jamestown, I was never the ma general manager. I was always the assistant GM, sales, marketing, community relations, and uh, it was always a pleasure. Like when I first got here, I, I was just I had been out of base. You know, I didn't have any baseball experience. I came here, I knew about it, but I didn't have the true appreciation probably for about the first seven or eight months of what Jamestown. Uh, jammers, expos back in all those days meant to the community. You know what I mean? I, I had been disconnected from it. But after my first year of learning that, and I'm, I remember how much pride I had in being part of what I thought was one of the best things that this county had. Like, right? I mean, we have the institution, we have the jammers. I thought we were in that category, you know? And uh, it was always a, a, a level of pride for me to be able to work for that kind of an operation so there is a baseball card out that was circulated recently of the uh, location uh, above the press box <laughs> oh. and it, uh, uh, it it's a picture a John a John and the top of the stadium in the press box area then you can open up the window sit there and watch the game now, was that installed with any of your time period, or was that a pre-date? And, and there's a story behind baseball card. One of you guys, I suspect, is involved in that. That was there when I got there. It was there when I got there, yeah. And, and we did a story on it that actually the CBS News covered. <laughs> and it ended up in, in USA Today about it's the only open-air toilet above a home plate in baseball. <laughs> I got Still there, guys. Still yeah. there. And, and uh, that's where I threw um, that's where I threw a PA announcer's copy of Bully Wooly out onto the field because he refused to stop playing it when we hit home runs. 
all the players had the songs they wanted. And he kept playing this and playing it and playing. Todd would just play it over and over and over. And I said, you play that one more time. I said, I'm going to throw it right out onto the field. And sure enough, he played it. And sure enough, I went into the bathroom and threw it out onto the field. In the middle of a game, by the way. It was between innings. And uh, the very next home run, I hear it again. And he opened up his case and he says, I can do this all season long. <laughs> he had 100 copies of Bully Wooly in the, in the, in the, uh, in the thing. But that, uh, and we also used to throw out the celebratory roll of toilet paper from there, too. That would spiral down onto the field afterwards. And, and uh, we, we learned not to do that. But, yeah, that was, that was there. They, they, I know they called it my office. I know they called it your office. You would see cigar smoke every night. No, I had to. <laughs> The one, the other I one. told you that's where you were going. <laughs> At the end of the press box, yeah, on my second year, I had to talk with the cable people in town, and I said, "As long as you're gonna, could you run a thing up there?" Because I'm a Yankee fan, so I would. I had a little TV in the corner, and I smoked cigars, as you know, and I would go up there, and I had a lazy boy chair, and I'd watch the game. I was always watching the game, but I also had the Yankees on in the corner, and. You, I brought my mother, my late mother, bless her soul. She was up there one time, and a foul ball came up and nearly took her head off. Oh, my gosh. So I said, I wouldn't bring guests up there anymore. But, no, that was – my office was at Dude, the end. next of, one over. Yeah. But you got to understand, the reason the window was there, it was 120 degrees. When you opened up the press packs for a game, there was no air conditioning up there, and it was sitting in the heat all day. It was yeah. hot. Yeah. It was Every, hot. Everybody always knew. They say, where did anybody spot Ferguson? And you would see all these heads in the press box, and you'd see someone's head down here, and they'd say – yeah, he's in the luxury suite. He's definitely not in. Watch the game. You know, that was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I thought you were going to ask if we ever used it. I'm never will answer that question. That's why my head was lower than everybody else. <laughs> I never did. No, <laughs> no but, you know, the, of course, the, I, 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 there are so many stories. But one of them you always mentioned, you know, the, the crowd during the course of a game is, is well in zone here. Where is David? And you could see this ring of sm cigar smoke come out of his office again. <laughs> he's right there in the suite. Yeah. He's in the executive Watching over suite. the fans. <laughs> yeah, the people. Now, George Sisson uh, was part of a bet, which is covered on YouTube, by the way, another one of those things, and a bet dealing with an all-star game, and you and Matt, tell the story. So we're down at the Brooklyn Cyclones are hosting the New York Penn League all-star game, and we were down there, and Gabby Sanchez was one of our uh, all-stars that year. So we're, we go to the stadium and we'll walk around and get tired of seeing all this nice stuff. And we have to go for the gala. And we're, they take us through the marine world there right on the, on the beach, right? And they have a tent set up so we go down there. And we're waiting for dinner. And we got the players there, and Matt and myself and Ben. And <clears throat> when stuff is free in minor league baseball, you take advantage of it as much as you can, <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> Well, Matt, Matt got himself uh, feeling pretty good about the event. And then they introduced the main speaker of the night, and it's Juan Marichal. And, and Matt, being the funny guy that he thought he was, he's like, Juan, 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 who is this guy? I'm yeah, like, it was Juan Marichal. So anyways, Matt was kind of distracted by the whole thing. Gabby Sanchez was sitting over there, and, and they were talking, laughing, and giggling about some different stuff. And, and Matt, I said, Matt, just settle down. Just let's get out of here. I didn't know what, George, I'm going to make a bet. I'm going to make a bet with you right now. If one of our guys gets a uh, MVP of the All-Star game, we're going to shave your head the next home game. And I'm like, <laughs> you're, you're really funny, but you think I'm going to go out there by myself. You're crazy. You've got to go in this bet, too. Gabby Sanchez says, I'm going to win MVP. So we laughed about it and so forth. Game comes the next night. Like the third inning, Gabby hits a single, drives in a run, like – our, lead, our team wins one nothing, and they named Gabby the MVP. Of the <laughs> <laughs> so we're riding home from New York, and we're like, we got to cut our hair. I had, I had a decent set of hair back then, right? I mean, it wasn't full, full, but I what had What are you looking some, up there for? No one's going to agree with you. I had to have somebody up there. So anyways, um, we had a double header later in the season. And Matt's like, oh, George, we got to do this. Matt's got a full head of hair. His is going to go back in a heartbeat. Mine was hanging on. I was hanging on. <laughs> and uh, so, middle of the doubleheader, they pull out some seats, and Matt's mother-in-law is a beautician, and she brings one of her girls down, and they 
they shave our head. Gabby comes out. He take you know, don't start on the side in case there's a mistake or anything, right? We're right down the middle. And, of course, Greg has his little camera. He films it all. Of course. And, uh, as you can see, it has never grown back. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to grow it back, but it gets to a certain level. I look like a bad Chia pet. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Get your hair cut at the, at the uh, ballpark, too. There you go. But we did, we did a hair cutting uh, one night for, um, for um, Cancer Awareness Night. We did a, a hair cut deal. People could come and get their hair cut. So. That's the one thing about minor league baseball. If, you, if there's an idea, it happens, doesn't That's it? Right. I mean, it, just some of the stuff that you come up with and do. So I had a bald guy night. Do you remember that? <laughs> I had a bald guy night, and I'd stand out in front of the stadium and anybody who brought or showed up bald got in free. <laughs> now the news were there, and they, a couple of young kids, I don't even know where they were from, they might have been traveling through, they said, well, you could cut our hair, we want to get in free. I said, the tickets are four bucks, you really don't, you know. We cut their hair right there on the front lawn, right in front of your yeah. sign. <clears throat> it was all over the news, and... Uh, it was a terrible, they had clumps and it was terrible, <laughs> but it was still, I said, well, that's what you want. Okay, go ahead, you go in now. You know, we had 500 people there that night. There's plenty of seats. And bald guy night was a huge success. And it was just, it was a Tuesday night. Usually a Tuesday night, we would have a weird idea. Just a promotion, a weird idea, because we had nothing else. And you get a shitty crowd, excuse my French. And it was just like, well, bald guy night. Or we had a kid that used to work for me named Kelly Johnson. Now I won't bring that up. So we had a, it was a whole different thing. But yeah, it was, a, but it was always on a Tuesday night. We had a full service Friday. And it, it probably is not politically correct now to, to, to do it. But we had somebody doing hair. We had somebody that, uh, uh, Jim's Cleaners came and picked up your cleaning. We bring it, would bring it to your house in, uh, two days later. But they picked it up at the ballpark. We did, uh, I forget all the other things we did, but we also had, there's a young guy who volunteered around the ballpark. And, and in fact, we built up such a great relationship that um, he and his friend would actually drive to the Buffalo Blizzard games to work for, with us at the Buffalo Blizzard and sell things. His name was Shweb Bamji. He's an attorney now. But uh, he, was a, he was a high school kid here. And part of full service night was Shweb and his brother would dress in, Turbans and all the Indian get, and they would wash your car and put a chocolate on your dashboard and come back and give you the keys at the end of the night. <laughs> and I said, probably couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> it was his idea. It was not my idea, it was his idea. But uh, it was great because the staff would just come up with great ideas on it, you know. And that's what it was all about. And it, as Dave said, the, this is this is the this is the guy that's he was our guru. Every game is an event. Um, Every game sold out. If there's only three people in the stands, or eighteen thousand, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and just uh, it, it find a way to keep people happy because we all knew that, yeah. Just as Dave said, you know, the game, <laughs> the game is the game, and we all love the game. But the, you either had a mom or dad who maybe didn't care, but they were going for the rest of the family. You had kids who definitely couldn't get through two, three innings without being distracted by somebody. So uh, you know, promotions is what bonded that family together and, and I'm sure you guys see it when you're in town and and I know Mike uh, uh, is I know his legacy you'll run into people now so I remember uh, well, well they remember when I knocked out one of the players parents throwing baseballs into the stands by accident but uh, in fact I think they were sitting right in front of the with a couple of rows down um, I didn't understand what the big hubbub was I was standing on the visitors dugout and throwing and the people that were sitting right about behind the net, which is tough to throw a ball behind the net from the top of the dugout. <laughs> so I, I gave this thing a pretty good throw. And all of a sudden, everybody's jumping up and down and going, oh, oh and I'm thinking, wow, they like that, huh? <laughs> no, I had hit him in the temple and knocked him out of his seat. And they had, his wife was calling for an ambulance, you know. So it was... Uh, it was that kind of, it was entertaining. You remembered it, right? People wonder why I didn't yeah. throw t-shirts yeah. into the crowd That's right. 
Tell me who won that night. You can't do that, but you can say that the, the general manager knocked somebody out in the, in the baseball. But uh, and that's what it was all about, is trying to do those things. And it, I, was, I was truly inspired, no nonsense, from the Derek Fireman liquor night. I said, boy, we can do that. And I remember that going to that game at, uh, at the old War Memorial, which is now all that's left is a wall now, the old War Memorial. And, uh, and going to that game, and, and it, Derek was able to attend, and you know, uh, Mike, Mike made, a, made him feel like a hundred bucks, you know, and a million dollars. Um, and that's the way you do it. And he taught me to carry a camera around at all times. You know, I mean, it didn't matter who you were, Mike, Mike would always stop you with a mascot, whether it was Buster Bison or J.J. Jammer or Miss Janet Jammer or whoever else would happen to be a mascot. I'm sure Bubba Grape and say, stand there, take a picture. And it was back then he would have it on your desk within a few days. You never now, told me about a camera. Email. You yeah. didn't tell me everything, did you? No, I didn't. Now it's easy. Now you got I phones know. now. It's easy. But back well, then I he would carry the little disposable cameras and... Uh, and it's it's all those things. It's hospitality, and uh, and and that's what really made it a lot of fun. Mike Bellani, you guys are talking stories here. My head is exploding, but Mike Bellani comes down in 1994. He's going to make a, a a big big play of Jamestown baseball, and he's here for every event. Man, we went to maple syrup things. We did everything. Mike was he walks into a room. He just lights it up. But I learned a technique, camera technique, okay? And it's been very helpful. You go into a crowd of people, of course, Mike, is, he attracts people. And next thing you know, you could tell he's listened to all he wants to listen to. And how do you get out of a conversation? How do you get out of a conversation? It's brilliant. He takes out his camera. <laughs> he simply says, everybody get together, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been fun. We'll see you at the ballpark. <laughs> so, Jacob, if you're looking, ever get there caught in a situation. I use this. It was spectacular. But you know what? The thing about it is, is he would get into conversations with total strangers. I remember we met at Spot Coffee after it was said and done. And, and uh, we met at Spot Coffee. And uh, there was a group of high school kids or, or elementary school kids sitting at the table or sitting off to the side. And Rico looks, he goes, what the hell are those kids doing here? He says, school day. I said, I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm not sure. And he gets up and he goes over. He says, what are you guys doing? Where you, where you go to school? Oh, we're done. We're done with school. We're, we came in for a cup of coffee. Where do you go to school? I got a project for you. He says, I need you to write. And he gave him a homework. He says, you bring that to me. And he gave him all his cards. And we'll get you into a free baseball game, and you know we'll show you around the stadium, the whole nine yards. And these kids at first were looking at him like, "Who the heck is this guy?" And but within five minutes, he had them doing a homework project rather than sitting in a in a coffee shop, you know. And and that's uh, that, that's a that's a that's not a skill that you can teach. That's one that's that's a built in. Well, and speaking of, by the way, speaking of the fact that the launch of this book, which is the you know the history of baseball in Jamestown. It, uh, and I know we're all very proud to be a part of it. it this you, you've got a, you've got an equally big book being launched very shortly about the history of baseball in Buffalo, New York, and uh, that's coming up when uh, probably early in November. Early well, why don't you talk about that? That was going to be kind of the segue. Thanks, Mike, for doing that. No problem. Uh, <laughs> first, first of all, uh, the book that we mentioned across the seams, which is the genesis of this book, was your idea. I mean, you're the guy that said you should capture this long-standing history and then immediately had me do all the work. And then David Wright, it was a beautiful thing. So what, why, why are you such a history guy? Uh, I just think that you have to capture, um, especially, you know, the sports history or, you know, the history of your community. And um, we did the same thing in 1985, really 84 in Buffalo. The next season was going to be the 100th season. And we had a historian, Joe Overfield, so he wrote that book, The 100 Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. And then, you know, almost 30 years later, his son wants to do an update and revision, and um, that's what we're doing, The Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. It was supposed to be out, like, almost two years ago, and timing is everything, and now uh, it'll include, we've delayed it, the de delayed the release of it, 
to include the 2020 season that in June was only <laughs> going to be uh, a couple sentences. You know, for the first time ever, the season was canceled. And then lo and behold, Toronto comes in. And so now it's a whole summary of Major League Baseball returns. So it's a pretty good uh, uh, capturing of the history of uh, professional baseball in Buffalo. Did you get to go to a game in Buffalo? Watched them all on TV, but no, I didn't go. Did, was well, I did watch it from the building right next door and overlooked it, but uh, no, I wasn't in there. They were pretty tight-fisted you know, to keep everyone out. I, we, we try, I tried in vain. I just want you to know. We, we made had 30 order. caps, so you couldn't get anywhere near the stadium. Yeah. yeah. The closest was that suite up in the big uh, M&T building or whatever it is. HSBC. The they, one. They, they had suites. Yeah, Doug Jamal had a, had a, right. a gimmick going on there. No, the better was next door, the old main, um, the Moran building right at uh, Seneca and Washington. Paul Kochmeyer owns that and his, um, their apartment's on the top floor and it looked right over first base. There we go. It shows uh, a good view. So well, what's, you. what's your big story? I mean, you're Jamestown, you know, Bob and Mindy and you were involved in that whole 1993 Burlington calls, bringing the mayors involved, mayoral candidates at the time in 1993. Uh, we had a Monday call with all three. They would commit to doing whatever they needed to do with the stadium. You were part of it, dandies. Uh, and then ultimately, there's, there's some back play going on with you and Niagara Falls, uh, which was part of the Sal Magley Stadium. Um, it's, it's kind of CSI intrigue. Why don't you give a little bit of the back story? Well, interestingly, uh, you know, that year, the New York Penn League um, said that the stadiums had to be brought up to these standards. And um, Jamestown had left and went to Burlington, Vermont, which ironically, the author of this book, uh, Joe Overfield, the story and his son, Jim Overfield, is a season ticket holder for the the team up there in uh, Burlington. But, um, so here Jamestown is without a team for, it was only a couple of days, but we had known they were out of a team and the current commissioner of your college <coughs> league team here, Bob Julian, was the president of the New York Penn League. And we went to the Niagara Falls mayor, he refused to do any work. And as we were walking out of there, we were on the phone um, to Greg, saying, hey, we've got a league meeting on Friday you know, can we uh, <coughs> make a motion to transfer the franchise to Jamestown? And, you know, then he got on the phone with the lawyers and, you know, the, r the rest is uh, history. Well, you had an interesting conversation with the mayor of the, of the city of Niagara Falls. Right. He didn't think you were going to do this. <laughs> yeah, he threatened us and said, you know, no one threatens me and you're not going anywhere. And on his front <laughs> stairs, we called Greg and said, we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Much happened in a very short period of time, but it wouldn't have happened without Mike Bellani. We all kind of lay, lay prostrate in front of you, yes, Mike. Uh, but but much happened in that 1994 year, because you were that. And uh, one, one memory, because we'll go on forever telling Mike Bellani stories, but it happened to be there was a Lucy Fest, a Lucy Fest prior to the 1994 season. And the star performers were the Smothers Brothers. And Mike, Mike Bolani says, you know, we need to get on stage because that's going to be a packed house. Greg, can you make that happen? I'm pretty well connected here, but nowhere near to say, we'll just somehow go ahead and walk <coughs> on the stage and present uh, something to the Smothers Brothers at a non-event. Non it's a Lucy Fest event. So Mike, undeterred, he comes with a bag. Comes with a bag, and I see him, and there's a line, as you can recall, all the way around the block, waiting to get in to see the Smothers Brothers. Mike blows in my ear and says, I've never met a line I like. Follow me. <laughs> so indeed, I did. I followed him. He then weasels his way with this bag into the theater, gets, of course, to the guy who's saying, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm the best friends with Tommy Smothers, and I'm here to deliver a message from Dr. Somebody you made up probably. 
And so next thing you know, they don't, because you're a presence. I mean, you're, you're a presence. So the guy opens the gate. I'm just following. Hi, Greg. Hi, 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 hi. And so we go there. And next thing you know, he knocks on the door. And the door's open. And there they are, you know, putting on their outfits. And hi, I'm Mike Bellani. And hi, the guys are shocked. <laughs> Who the hell are you? And he goes, well, I bring greetings from Dr. So-and-so. And da 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 something he made up. And I'd like to present to you during the stage performance, Jammer's Jerseys. And go ahead, you can tell the rest of the story. And then we went out on stage and they just used those jerseys to play off each other. It, it's another YouTube and video Greg moment and track. you'll see it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and of course, after he pants to them and they actually put on the Jammer's, at, just as the, it's towards the end of their yeah. first half, uh, Tommy Smothers, or Dick, yeah, Tommy Smothers turns to Dick and says, hey, you know, this is nice to have a Jammer's jersey, but I'd rather have a Cummins engine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we got all kinds of play. That whole year, you did more unbelievably crazy-ass things, but did lead to the book. And, and if you had to go, let me just go down as we cycle around. You got Jacob Kinberg right there, and if there was one bit of advice in a, in a few words, to give to Jacob, what would you give to him? And I'll, I'll start with you, George, you first, and then end up with Mike. Well, I think the thing that um, resonated with me when I first got to Jamestown and then I, when we worked with all of our young people that worked with us during the summer is that we tried to remember that tonight somebody's going to be their first time ever at Dietrich Park. It's going to be their first Maybe it's the first Jamestown game. Maybe it's their first professional baseball game ever. And so it's even if it's a Tuesday night in the middle of late July and you're tired or whatever, tonight's going to be somebody's first time there. And make sure that that night is special. And I remember one of the things I used to do is pack my, my uh, pockets full of baseballs. I was the on-field guy, so I got a chance to be out on the field every night. But you would walk around the crowd in between innings and you'd see that little guy running for a baseball and by about the fifth inning he still didn't have a baseball. And so you make sure that that guy got a baseball. Just, just make sure that, that every time you open the gate, it's somebody's first time either at Jamestown or it's their first baseball game and make sure you make them a fan. And on behalf of Jamestown Community Baseball, Jacob, we'll probably give you baseball cards to give to those kids instead of baseball game, baseballs. That's the ownership perspective. <laughs> David, what, what was your, what your advice to Jacob? All right, I'm going to give you a business end. And this worked for me big time all five years is <coughs> when you finally have your budget, which you don't have it yet, but once you finally have the budget, and it's all different lines, never go over any budget. Now, if you've got $3,000 under one budget line and you've got to spend $3,500, you have got to find the $500, you take the $500, from another budget line. Because the bottom line comes down when you present it to these guys and your board and everything, <laughs> they're gonna wanna know, well, why were you over budget? When you, if you watch your budget like a hawk, and part two of that is hire a good woman. This is probably sexist, like you're not with the, with the <laughs> turban, no. Uh, uh, hire a good one who really will do your books. And you say to her, look at, we're gonna go over we're at three thousand two hundred on a three thousand dollar budget line. We need to find. We need to take two hundred from somewhere else. You'll always find it. There's always going to be a budget line. You might. You might do without on one thing. You take it from there. She'll do it on the computer, and then your budget's set again. At the end of the year, you'll appreciate it because you'll have. You'll be in the black. You won't be in the red. You'll be in the black. But don't even get tempted to say, oh, well, and well, this is, I gotta save Mike. But Mike had an unlimited pot of money with the buys, so he would basically, he didn't worry about a budget. It was, ah, spend it. Once you're at the little time, you know, you gotta do it. And if you do it like that, you'll be in the black. In the middle of September, when you go in front of these guys, you'll be presenting numbers that are in the black. And that's, that's all the other stuff you know you gotta sell. As many signs in the outfield as you can get around the sides, with your concessions, all that other baloney, as many sells, and if you could sell a sign for 100, you'll find a spot for it. Yeah. Sell, 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 because the baseball 
people will take care of the baseball on the field. You don't even have to worry about that. It's selling. And if you do that, you'll be a success. And I, with these guys behind you, I don't see why you can't. So congratulations, incidentally. Michael. I'm pretty sure Dave learned about that budget after seeing mine because mine didn't follow that rule at all. No shit. <laughs> I was going to say it, but yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> they, they, gave, they gave him my budget and said, don't do this, whatever you do. <laughs> but, I wasn't going to say that, but you're right. Yeah, there you go. But uh, uh, the, bottom, the bottom line is, is they're creating memories. You're creating memories, as, as George was saying. And we all said that, and we all learned that uh, from the best in the game. You know, and um, uh, you're you're going to create what I learned. You know what I what I experienced as a child. Crack of the bats. Don't, don't underestimate. Don't underestimate the traditions of baseball and the traditions of this community, because that's what it's all about, and that's what wins you fans. That's what will fill the seats back up on nights that you may not be able to fill. That is the respect for you that you have for the community and for the game, okay? All the other stuff, is, it, 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 as we all said, all the other stuff is, is great, but the bottom line is there's respect for the game. You know, I, I used to tell people when I, when I was in the soccer business, they, you guys know Buffalo soccer, they used to play music and scream and holler during the game. And I went to that board of directors and I said, you guys gotta stop this. Those are professional athletes, they're getting paid respect the game, let the kids, let the parents watch what the experts do. <laughs> They're here to see the game. The other stuff is merely what happens when the ball stops. <laughs> and uh, if you do that, and you follow a budget, <laughs> you're gonna be very successful at it. I wanna preface something, because I scare the hell out of everybody. I don't have COVID, I don't have the flu. They've switched my heart medication and it causes me to cough all the time. So you're not going to catch anything from me other than maybe... A, oh, I've got COVID. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know we were bringing up, but that's yeah, it. Yeah, but uh, it, 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 whenever I'm in a room and someone hears me cough, I can see the eyes roll. That's all it is. But uh, um, that's what I would suggest. And, uh, and, and, just, uh, and you already know that. If you've, been, you've been here your whole life. You've seen some of the best baseball that this community has had to offer and, and some of the best people... Uh, you know, that have been examples in the past. And just continue that because that's what filled seats and they're looking for that to come back again. They miss that. They miss baseball. They haven't had baseball in a few years. And, uh, and, and you can be a first time experience. I would just say, do whatever the major league does within your budget. You know, we had, we talked about those giant scoreboards and you would see the, either the, the batting helmets or you'd see the NASCARs going around on the big jumbotrons racing each other. We took uh, two by fours, and one of the beer companies had uh, had cardboard NASCARs that they used in the grocery stores, and we nailed them to the two by fours. And in between innings, pick your car, and I would have interns running the length of the outfield fence, which, by the way, is one of the biggest outfields in North America. And whoever got to the to the pole, uh, you, you won. But it was our way of putting on something that you would see on a jumbotron. And you knew it was cheesy, you knew it was tacky, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a fun thing to do. So keep it fun. Final word, the Michael <coughs> Well, Congratulations on the position, and um, just as these guys said, you've got it out in the community, um, and no idea is a bad idea. But one of the things we used to do was, uh, in each of the cities, is we put together a, a business uh, advisory group um, I'd go a step further and, and almost have like town hall meetings around and get, you know, business leaders to host a breakfast in, you know, uh, Gary or uh, Brockton or any of the little towns around here. But also I'd reach out and put together like an advisory group of um, kids and, you know, just go up the ladder, kids and teens and, you know, women and, and others and just get their ideas. and make them sort of a part of it so that you, you, you're only one person. But if you get more people bought into uh, the project, um, they're your eyes and ears out in the street. So good luck. 
Well, the ultimate, I don't know who actually had the idea of the, the promotion. I will give you all credit, Balani, but somebody else. It just so happened our opening day, of which, of course, we, the advisory committee and other people had to be there, was June 18th. It was always June 18th. And June 18th is always my anniversary. And therefore, I had to convince my spouse, uh, hopefully she's still here she's behind She's gone, she left she about left. years ago. Okay, so she bolted, stuff. right? Yeah. Well, anyways, for the, for the camera, I want you to know that I always had to somehow encourage the management to make sure, because you gave out the Sweetheart of the Game Award, that on June 18th, the winner for three years in a row was my wife, because <laughs> that was the only way <laughs> I could pull that off. So, Thank great you. promotion. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys for making the extraordinary effort. Thanks for everybody for coming today on this, this book launch. And uh, we look forward to our uh, successful 2021 when the Tarp Skunks come back. And, but until then, we can say we're the only team in organized baseball has yet to lose. So for that, thank you. Thanks for doing it, Greg. Thank you very much.